presentation. I want to thank our team, Executive Director of the Museum, Adrian McGraw, and Dr. Rachel Teasdale, Gateway Board Member and Professor in the Geological Sciences Department at CSU Chico. And we are grateful to our partner, North State Public Radio, which is a co-sponsor of this series. We are especially appreciative of all our speakers who are donating their time, talents, and knowledge to the furtherance of teaching and learning about science in our region and beyond. And we do acknowledge and are mindful that CSU Chico stands on lands that were originally occupied by the first people of this area, the Machupta. We recognize their distinctive spiritual relationship with this land and the waters that run through campus. And we are humbled that our campus resides upon sacred lands that once sustained the Machupta people for centuries. This evening, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Kathy Busby, Professor Emerita and Research Scientist in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department at UC Davis. She was a first generation college student, received her BS degree from UC Berkeley, her PhD from Princeton University, and was a faculty member at UC Santa Barbara for over three decades. She is a consultant on the fossil discovery project that we are here to learn more about after being introduced to it by Ranger Greg Francic last week. She is tasked in partnership with Dr. Montana Hodges with the accurate dating or geochronology of the site, which you may hear informally or may be formally referred to as the Miocene view. Frankly, I love that title. Dr. Busby has done extensive research in the field of volcanology. She will be sharing with us information about the ancient river valleys and chain of volcanoes of the area and explosive eruptions which filled the Paleo River Valleys with pumice and ash, burying and then preserving the fossils that make up this amazing trove. Dr. Busby will take your questions at the end of her talk and we invite you to use the chat column or raise your hand with questions or comments at the end. And remember that we are recording the Zoom meeting, so if you don't want to be recorded, you may simply switch your video off. Dr. Busby, we are so honored to have you with us this evening. Adrian, let her unmute. Ah, oh, there we go. Am I unmuted? Yes. yes. I <laughs> Okay, um, thank you everybody for showing up. And um, I, I hope that this talk is uh, not too full of jargon or too technical. Um, and uh, normally if I was in a classroom, I would tell people just shout out if I say something you don't understand. But in this sort of format, I guess that's, that's too difficult. Um, but I do have the chat open, I don't know if it would be allowable for people to put questions in the chat as they go. Um, that way, if I see something come up, I can right away try to plug that hole. <laughs> but um, I did my best to, to make this as non-technical as possible because I know some of you, or a lot of you are probably not geologists. Um, so <laughs> with that, I think I will share my screen. Do you see what I see? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about how the volcanoes that existed um, when the Miocene, Miocene Zoo formed uh, contributed to their, uh, their formation and preservation. And also talk about Paleo River Valleys of the Sierra Nevada. And probably a lot of you already know about this amazing discovery of um, a fossil, a Miocene fossil trove um, in the Sierra Nevada foothills near Sacramento um, with mastodon, rhinos, giant tortoises, tapirs, horses, and over 600 petrified trees that have been found so far. So um, there's some pictures that I just got off the Chico website um, showing a couple of the people in the field and people in the lab and I basically, I knew Rush Shapiro when he was a graduate student at UC Santa Barbara. 
And um, he was my teaching assistant actually for field camp. And then on Facebook, I started seeing things about this Miocene zoo. And I was like, hey, those are the kind of rocks I work on. So I got in touch and got to have a personal tour and made some observations that I think can really help the work along. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so the Miocene Zoo is a very rich fossil trove that was discovered in the Sierra Nevada foothills by Greg Fran Franchuk. Did I say that right? Franchuk or Franchuk? Um, and he's a, a naturalist for East Bay Municipal Utilities District. And he took uh, me and some other people out there last summer. Um, and then, as you probably know, Professor Russell Shapiro is heading the paleontological work. And Professor Todd Green is in charge of the sedimentology and stratigraphy. And then on the bottom right, you see Montana Hodges, a professor at Sierra Nevada University. She and I are working on dating the deposits. But also, um, because I've worked on these kinds of rocks all over the Sierra Nevada for 18 years, um, I think I also have some contributions to make in terms of the setting. <clears throat> so first of all, let's, let's talk about what is the Miocene, the Miocene Zoo. Um, here's the, the decade of North American geology time scale, the one that most people use. And you can see, um, we're gonna go back in time. The Holocene is the last glacial <clears throat> retreat. That's what we're in now. And then the Pleistocene is the ice ages of advancing and retreating ice. And that covers about 1.8 million years. <coughs> and then the Pliocene covers about 1.7 million years. And then the Miocene covers 18 million years. It's a really long time. And so um, saying something's Miocene has a very big age range. Um, Based on correlation with other dated fossils, the Miocene Zoo is thought to be somewhere between 12 and 5 million years, which is also a very long time. So that's why we're using radiometric dating to try to get a more precise age of the fossil locality. The reason the fossil ages are not precise is that fossils have ranges of ages. They're not a moment in time. Um, you know, a, a given fossil could exist for millions of years. Um, whereas with radiometric dating, you get a number and, and then a plus or minus on that number. And the better your technique, you know, the better, the smaller the plus or minus. <clears throat> so radiometric dating is basically taking advantage of the fact that a radioactive parent isotope of an element decays at a known rate. And then that produces a daughter product. And you can measure the daughter product and calculate then the age of the mineral that, that those elements are in. So we're using a couple of different techniques. <clears throat> One is that potassium decays to argon in a variety of minerals, including feldspar shown here as this white mineral and hornblende, this dark green mineral. And then the other um, radiometric clock that we're using is the decay of uranium, actually two different isotopes of uranium that de decay to two different isotopes of lead in the mineral zircon. And as I'll, as I'll tell you, there's volcanic pumice and ash that we've discovered in the deposits, and these minerals are all common in the volcanic pumice and ash. Okay. So <clears throat> that was one of the really exciting things when I went out there last summer and looked around was how much volcanic ash and pumice there was in the deposit with the fossils. <clears throat> so looking at the picture on the left, these white rocks are actually pumice like you have to scrub your feet in your bathtub. And they're kind of mixed in with gravels that are darker colored that are just rock fragments. <clears throat> and then in the picture on the right, you can see this bedded sandstone, which is buff, and it has white layers within it. 
you'd you know I'd have an allergy attack now. <clears throat> um, and the white layers are ash, volcanic ash, and the tan layers are sandstone. So that was very exciting to see that. And I collected samples of it, took them home, looked at them under the microscope, decided that they were very fresh, which is good because the, the radiometric dating doesn't work if the rocks are really altered. So this is very exciting. <clears throat> so what is volcanic pumice and ash and how is it made? Well, pumice is, what you see here is pumice floating in a beaker of water. Um, it's made of glass and crystals, volcanic crystals, volcanic glass and volcanic crystals, and it's so full of bubbles that it floats on water. And the pumices can be centimeters to meters in size. And it's very, it's white colored. <clears throat> and then volcanic ash is glass particles that are produced when pumices explode. And we'll explain that in a few minutes. So volcanic ash is these, these volcanic glass particles that are about sand size. And these are pictures, there's someone holding a pile of volcanic ash, it's very white. Um, and then magnification showing um, these things that are less than two millimeters each that are pumice shreds and broken cuspate glass shards. So how does pumice and ash form? They form in explosive eruptions of magmas that are, magmas molten rock that are rich in silica. So referred to as rhyolite or dacite. And these explosive, these highly explosive eruptions are called Plinian eruptions because they were first described at Vesuvius in 79 AD when, um, when um, Mount Pelé erupted, not Mount Pelé, <laughs> Vesuvius erupted. <clears throat> so if we're looking at like this cross section of a volcano, when magmas are rising toward the surface, there's less and less pressure on them as they ascend. And so the gas bubbles that are in them can form and then they get bigger and bigger because there's less and less pressure. Now, if you're looking at a basalt magma, like on Hawaii, those are low in silica and they're very runny. And so while the magma is rising, the gas bubbles can just sort of come out and rise up above the magma. But if you're dealing with a high silica magma, like rhyolite, it's too sticky. It traps the gas bubbles and they just get bigger and bigger until it blows the magma apart and then it explodes. So a, so a plenty, this is called a Plinian eruption and it can spread ashfall over many, many um, hundreds uh, or thousands of miles. Um, and here's a picture of Mount St. Helens um, in eruption in 1980, showing you the Plinian column rising up into the sky. So that ashfall falls over a large area and then it can wash off everywhere into the streams and the streams become choked with ash. And I think this is what happened at the Miocene Zoo. What we're looking at on the right down here is ash fall from Papua New Guinea um, in 1984, Rebel Volcano. And it looks like snow, but it's a lot heavier than snow and it causes damage, it causes roofs to collapse and so on. <clears throat> Now there's another thing that can happen during an explosive eruption, a, a Plinian eruption, which is that you can have these density currents that move along the land and you know hug the ground. They're called pyroclastic density current. Pyroclastic means um, hot class, class made by fire, right? And so it's the pumice and ash, but it's moving down the side of the volcano. And these are uh, up to 1,000 degrees centigrade and they can travel 700 kilometers an hour. And they go at least 10 to 15 kilometers from the volcano, sometimes a lot further. So the deposit of one of these is kind of a jumble of pumice and ash all mixed together. And it can be meters thick or hundreds of meters thick. <clears throat> 
So the pyroclast, the pyroclastic ash rains out of the sky and is like snowfall covering everything. Whereas pyroclastic flows hug ground. So they come down the valleys. <clears throat> and when they do that, the loose pumice and ash can mix with the water and the gravel that's in the rivers. And this causes flooding downstream. So what you see on the left is a picture of, of Mount of Pinatubo, the Pinatubo eruption in 1991, the stream valley before the eruption and the stream valley after the eruption. So they really get clogged up and, and can cause a lot of flooding. So um, now what, what, what I wanna ask is where was the volcano and what river flooded if we're looking at this kind of um, idea? So this is a picture I took of one of the petrified logs at the Miocene Zoo. So to answer those questions, we have to back up and, and look at the geology of the Sierra Nevada. <clears throat> so if we look at the Sierra Nevada today, it's a, a tilted block that has faults on its eastern side. So you know how when you're in Bishop, um, the, the mountain range just goes straight up. That's because it's a fault scar here. Whereas when you're coming up the west side, it's a very gentle gradient to go all the way up to the crest. <clears throat> and it's because of this block faulting. And the way that the streams are arranged today, they run east to west down that block. But these faults haven't always been there. In fact, they, they began to form only about 12 to 6 million years ago. And in some places, maybe only 3 million years ago. So what did the Sierra Nevada look like before that, possibly in the time range of the Miocene Zoo? Well, before those faults formed, the Sierra Nevada lay on the Western shoulder of a very broad uplift. So the, it was a very broad uplift, as big as the Andes. So, but instead of being called the Altiplano, like the Andes, it's called the Nevada Plano because it's thought to have been as big as the Andes. And the crest lay in Eastern Nevada and it was downhill all the way from Eastern Nevada to the Central Valley of California. Um, and so the paleo, the paleo river valleys that formed at that time ran, they had their, they had their heads way East in Nevada. So here's California. Here's where the future um, range crest would be, where the faults are now, and, and Nevada. So these were very long rivers. So the thing that we call the Nevada Plano, which is basically centered over Nevada here, was uplifted and eroded from about 80 million years ago to about 55 million years ago. And this green dash line shows where the divide was, where the crest was. And the reason they can tell that, the people that have figured this out, is because streams run to the east over in here, and they run to the west. The paleo, the paleo valleys ran to the west over in here. <clears throat> so the arrows are showing the downslope direction. Now, the, the paleo valleys have been disrupted a lot in Nevada because there's been a lot of faulting there since then. Um, so they're partly buried by faults. But the Sierra Nevada block is, as I showed you in the previous diagram, it's, it's pretty much a fault along the range front and the main block is not faulted. So we can see these ancient valleys that predated any of the modern um, river valleys and they're very well preserved. So let's take a look at what is in these paleo valleys. And you know, when you've been driving around, you've probably seen some road cuts through big sandstones and gravels and things. So what we're gonna look at is what's in this fill because the zoo is in a paleo valley. That's what I'm leading toward. So we already talked about the uplift and, and the deep erosion and the cutting of the Paleo Valleys. And then the first deposits in the Paleo Valleys are Eocene. 
and they consist of braided stream deposits, sands and gravels, and they have gold nuggets. Um, so this is the, the California gold rush <laughs> was after these and they hydraulically mined these Eocene braided streams deposits, they're rock, and, and they mined it hydraulically and all the sediment got dumped in the rivers and went in the Sacramento Delta and caused kind of an environmental mess, um, wouldn't be allowed now. But it powered the world economy for years, thanks to these paleo valleys. So here is a, a, like a cross section as if you were cut through a paleo valley and the paleo valley is coming out toward you. And so what you have was the, the, the basement that got eroded and then a deposit of Eocene gravels with the gold nuggets. <clears throat> Next thing in the stratigraphy is these, um, these oligocene ignimbrites that were erupted in Nevada. So what is an ignimbrite and where, what, how do they form? Um, these are referred to, if you're familiar with stratigraphy, as the um, Valley Springs Formation. And that's, that is in the, the Miocene Zoo Paleo Valley. Uh, I don't think anyone's found the, any gold in the Miocene Zoo Paleo Valley. <laughs> but they have, we have found the Oligocene ignimbrites. Um, <clears throat> so what is an ignimbrite? An ignimbrite is a... a, a, a high silica pyroclastic flow, pumice rich. And these ignimbrites erupted from giant continental calderas that were in central Nevada. So what is a giant continental caldera? It's, if you've been to Yellowstone, if I was in a classroom, I'd say, how many people been to Yellowstone? <laughs> we can't do that on Zoom. Uh, Yellowstone is like this giant hole in the ground. It's about 60 kilometers wide and you don't even know you're in it because it's so big but you can see it on you know, satellite imagery. And it's a hole in the ground that was created by a very, very large volume eruption, of explosive eruption of pumice and ash that emptied the magma chamber, partially emptied the magma chamber below Yellowstone. And all, a lot of material erupted out explosively and the roof of the magma chamber subsides down in and leaves a big hole. So it's not a hole that explodes out, it's a hole that subsides down, the roof subsides in. So uh, these, these giant continental calderas were, here we are, uh, here's the paleo divide of the Nevada Plano and the Oligocene calderas are here in central Nevada, shown by these green circles. And these very large volume pumice rich pyroclastic flows, they're hot, you know, they're 600 degrees centigrade. And they flowed westward down these paleo valleys, a distance of over 230 kilometers all the way to the Central Valley. And uh, I, the Brian Hausbach has organized a thing called the, uh, the, the Volcano Observatory of Sacramento. And one of the talks was by Chris Henry of the University of Nevada, Reno, who's worked a lot on these calderas and then on the pyroclastic flows that came down these channels. And he was talking about the threat to Sacramento. Ha ha. It was 30 million years ago, 20 million years ago. It's not, not going to happen now. But they did flow right over where Sacramento is. And, and um, um, so that was in the Oligocene. And then what this also shows is that the, oh, here, this is showing the reason that these calderas formed is because of subduction. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. So subduction is where one plate, the oceanic plate dives down under the continent and goes back into the mantle. We'll take a look at that. Um, and then the, the oceanic plate can, can become flatter, the subductive plate can become flatter with time or it can become steeper with time. If it becomes steeper with time, then the volcanoes will move toward the trench. And that's what happened um, in the Miocene, a chain of 
andesite volcanoes migrated westward with Tara. So we'll take a look at that. And that's referred to as the Ancestral Cascades Arc. <clears throat> so what is subduction? Here we see an ocean plate diving under the continent to go back into the Earth's mantle. And this causes melting to, provide, to, uh, to produce magmatism on the overriding plate. So in the Oligocene, when those co giant continental calderas were formed, those are on the thickest part of the Nevada Plano. So that thick crust melted and produced giant continental calderas. But then as the magmatism swept west toward California, it moved on to thinner crust and it produced a chain of andesite volcanoes, very much like the Cascades today. So the andesite stratovolcanoes are Lassen, Shasta, Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, and so on. So what is an andesite volcano? So these are also called stratovolcanoes or composite cones. And here's a very simplified cartoon of one. Um, they alternate between quiet eruptions of lava, mainly andesite, which is intermediate in silica. But then they can have explosive eruptions of high silica magma, which is rhyolite or dacite. And that's what produces the white pumice and ash. These high silica eruptions have zircon, which we use for dating. And their, their deposits are far more extensive. The lavas that come out of a stratovolcano don't go far at all from the base of the volcano, if they even make it down to the base of the volcano. Whereas these high silica explosive eruptions, as we've already talked about, can spread airfall ash over huge areas. And also the pyroclastic flows can go many tens of kilometers. So our interpretation um, that I've been angling toward is after I went and saw all the pumice and ash in the deposits, um, I, I came up with the idea that the Miocene Zoo was buried by floods that were generated by an explosive eruption upstream. And I've been looking at the rocks upstream, the Miocene rocks upstream at Abbott's Pass. We've made really detailed maps and dates and chemistry, and we've published all these papers on those volcanic rocks. So I know what is up, up the paleo channel. Up, upstream, what was upstream in the Miocene when the zoo was forming. And then it's the perfect scenario for preserving fossils because first of all, you bury, you, you, the flooding buries everything so it can't um, uh, decompose. And, and then the ash beds are rich in silica and ground, when groundwater moves through the deposits, it it leaches out the silica from the ash and deposits it in the fossils and preserves that. Um, and then of course the ash and the pumice are datable by radiometric dating. So perfect. <clears throat> so you'll hear if you see anything, you know, any press releases or you've been talking to the people um, working on these rocks, they're referred to as the Merton Formation and that is a real catch-all name. Um, it was first proposed actually by Garnus Curtis, who was a professor at Berkeley, and he did his PhD on the volcanic rocks, the Miocene volcanic rocks in the Sierra Nevada in 1953, and proposed the name Merton Formation for all of the ancestral Cascade Arc rocks. So the volcanic rocks, and associated rocks that are around volcanoes. Um, but it's a catch-all name and it covers all, a lot of different rock types. And, you know, like we said, the Miocene covers um, 20 million years. So it's, it's a long time. Um, so basically what we're looking at now, we're gonna talk some more about the ancestral Cascades arc and how um, this chain of volcanoes migrated westward with time from Western Nevada into Eastern California. So here's a block diagram I made for a paper I published in 2016. 
that shows what the Sierra Nevada looked like when the when the the ancestral Cascades arc lay in western Nevada. So here is a gold dash line to give you reference of where the Sierra Nevada range crest lies today, but it wasn't there, um, you know, in the in the early Miocene. So in the early Miocene, the chain of volcanoes lay well into Nevada, east of the future Sierra Nevada crest. And there's a series of paleo channels that come down that were, that were being fed from the volcanoes. Um, here we see the pink is those oligocene ignimbrites that, um, that I was talking about that came from the calderas, Valley Springs formation or, or Delacruz formation in the Northern Sierra. And then those are overlaid by these andesitic um, lavas and debris flows and stream deposits um, at, that came down from the volcanoes down the channels. So I've shown here some of the cha paleo channels or paleo valleys, people use the same word interchangeably, paleo valley, paleo channel. We've worked on the Stanislaus paleo channel, the cataract, there's one that goes through Carson Pass, Kirkwood, Hope Valley, and the McCallum Paleo Channel, which has, um, has the crest is Ebbets Pass for the McCallum Paleo Valley. So the McCallum Paleo Valley is the zoo, the Miocene Zoo is at the downstream end of the McCallum Paleo Valley. So what is a debris flow deposit? Because they are present in all of these paleo valleys. And as you probably know, debris flows can be triggered by heavy rains like this one in January 2018 in Montecito, California. And they're capable of carrying huge boulders. Um, they're, they're, the mud is much thicker than water and can support um, big, big boulders. But volcanic, you can also get debris flows triggered by volcanic eruptions. And these are sometimes referred to as lahars. And in this case, you have volcanic debris that's erupted and it enters streams and mixes with the water and the gravels in the stream and keeps going down the valley, mixing with the water and gravel, doing a process that's referred to as bulking up. It just gets bigger and bigger because it's picking up more and more of the water and, and more and more of the gravel and sand in the stream. So the volumes can get 10 times bigger by this process. And these can travel quite, quite far, about 200 kilometers. Um, and this is showing a bridge that was destroyed by volcanic debris flows resulting from the eruption of Mount St. Helens. This, these went way down the Toodle River and they can be very dangerous because People won't even necessarily know there was an eruption a hundred miles away, but the, the debris flow can come and bury you anyway. Okay, so by the late Miocene, which is about when we should be looking at for the Miocene Zoo, about 12 to 5 million years is the late Miocene, the volcanic chain had migrated from Nevada into California and was at the crest of what is now the Sierra Nevada. And at the same time, range front faulting began. And so here is the McKelmney Paleo Channel. Here are some faults that formed at the crest. So it began cutting, the faults began cutting off this McKelmney Paleo Channel from its sources to the east in Nevada. So here we see that on the east side, it's the, pa the paleo channel is now buried under a volcano that's in a basin with faults bounding it. But on the west side, this volcano built up high enough out of this basin to shed material down what I call the relict McCallumney paleo channel because it's pretty small by this point. It's only a hundred miles long, whereas before it was 250 miles long. Um, but it's still acting as a river channel or a river valley. Um, so what we have done with our detailed mapping is we've recognized this volcano that grew um, at what is now Ebbets Pass on the Sierra Crest um, about um, 
seven to four million years ago. And so it's a it's a an eroded stratovolcano. The top has been sort of eroded off by um, by the glaciations that have happened in the Sierra Nevada in the last two million years. But it's still got a very nice um, volcano shape. And lava is coming out of this flowed part of the way down the McCallumney Paleo Valley, but not as far as the zoo because lavas don't generally flow very far. But the pumice and ashes and the debris flows traveled much further down the Paleo Valley, down to where the zoo is. <clears throat> so let's just compare what the Paleo Valley deposits look like up at the Sierra Crest where the volcanoes lay and compare the rocks to what the rocks look like in the Miocene Zoo about 100 miles downstream, down the Paleo Stream. So first of all, lavas with columnar joints. Maybe some of you have seen this before. Columnar joints form <clears throat> by cooling and shrinking of the lava as it cools down from you know, 900 degrees centigrade to zero. Um, these, these lavas didn't reach as far as the zoo, but volcanic debris flow deposits did reach down the, chan the Paleo Valley as far as the zoo. Um, but the volcanic debris flow deposits up at the crest are much coarser um, because they're closer to the volcano. And then also the stream deposits up at the crest are much coarser. You can see these huge boulders um, with my, my, one of my graduate students modeling the, how big the boulders are. So much coarser. But some of the deposits are identical. So what we see here is a tan sandstone with these white layers full of little pumices. And that is, this is in the zoo. And here's the pumices in the zoo. This is up at the crest and very similar. Tan sandstones interbedded with these pumice rich, white pumice rich or ash rich layers. Um, and these are deposited by <clears throat> streams. The only difference is that at the crest where you're closer to the vents for the volcanoes, the pumices are angular. They, they are still angular from the explosive eruption. Whereas by the time they get carried by the river all the way down to the Miocene Zoo, they're rounded. So that's the main difference. But it doesn't take much to round pumice, it's pretty soft. Also, the, 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 the pyroclastic fall deposits, the, the um, pumice and ash fall deposits, are much thicker at the crest than they are down in the Paleo Valley, and they're coarser. So at the crest, we see these coarse ashes and these pumice-rich beds, and it's about a two-meter thick deposit. At the Miocene Zoo, the, 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 the discrete beds of ash are, are fine. They're fine-grained ash um, because they fell further from the eruption and their, the beds aren't as thick. Okay, then last but not least, how did the critters and the plants get buried um, in a flood? Oh, after, sorry, after the critters and the plants got buried in a flood triggered by an explosive eruption, how did they get petrified? <clears throat> well, as I mentioned before, the floods would bury them rapidly and the, they don't get a chance to decay. And then the volcanic ash breaks down in groundwater. So the silica goes into solution in the groundwater, forming silicic acid, and then it silicifies the fossils. And this happens very quickly within tens of thousands of years, which geologically speaking is very fast. Um, here's a, uh, a Miocene tree trunk at the Sierra Crest. Um, just to show you that we have the same things. We have the fossilized tree trunk in the, in the Miocene. Um, and then I've just come up with some examples where volcanic ash um, was instrumental in not only burying the critters, but solidifying them, you know, preserving them um, as fossils. So the Petrified Forest National Park is, of course, very famous. And I didn't realize until I was putting this talk together how many fossils they have there. I was, you know, oh, they've got beautiful petrified wood. Oh yeah, but they have crocodile-like fossils, amphibians, early dinosaurs, freshwater snails and clams. 
And then there's a whole host of other examples. The, the Morrison Formation in Utah. Um, there's a whole series of petrified forests in Patagonia. And those include mammals. There are 150 to 65 million years. Um, there's a petrified forest in Argentina at 140 million years. The Gallatin Petrified Forest um, is in Montana and, and in Yellowstone, there's a, um, a specimen ridge. And those were eruptions from the Abserica volcanic field. Um, there's a famous petrified forest in Peru that has um, ashes. The, uh, there's a, a, an example in Lesbos, Greece that have gigantic trees, three meters in diameter. Um, there's the Ginkgo, uh, Ginkgo Petrified Forest in Washington. And then our most local example is in Calistoga, California with enormous redwoods. So these are all examples where volcanic ash not only helped bury the deposits, but provided the silica to preserve the fossils. So the conclusions are that the Miocene Zoo was buried by floods generated by an explosive eruption upstream. Um, from, from it at what is now Ebbets Pass. And the ash beds in the Miocene Zoo provided the silica to preserve the fossils when groundwater moved through the deposits. And the ash and pumice are datable. And that is work that um, I have in progress with Montana, Montana Hodges. And to close up, uh, just to show you a shot of an incredible trip I took um, about five years ago, um, there's a picture of me in front of a valley filled with ash and pumice. It's the Valley of 10,000 Smokes from the 1912 Novarupta eruption in Katmai National Park, Alaska. And that was a week-long backpacking trip and it was gnarly. <laughs> it's just amazing. It was very physically demanding and very beautiful. But um, just, you know, 1912, this is what happened. and. Um, I think it's, you know, there's a lot of analogs with, with the Miocene Zoo. So contact me if you have any questions later. There is my email address and um, I'm ready for questions. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. This was really, really informative. Um, really interesting that um, there's not just the Cascade Range in our backyard, but there's an ancestral Cascade Range as well. So. Yes. That's really exciting to think about um, more volcanoes. You know, I'm a fan of that. Yes, the more the better. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so I want to um, open things up for questions. If you have questions, please type them in the chat or if you raise your hand, um, I'll, um, I'll call on you um, and we'll you know, do some manipulations with the Zoom to, to help you speak. Um, but I also want to remind everybody that the fossil zoo that Kathy referred to um, is part of a collection that will be on display at Gateway. And um, in the chat is a link to um, more information about the exhibition. Um, and so we encourage you to visit Gateway um, and come see the fossils that have been collected uh, from this, this um, site and see for yourself the solicitation of the fossils from the ancient an ancestral volcano um, uh, ancestral ash, cascade. Okay. <laughs> ancestral cascade. I don't even okay. know what I said. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, so we have a few questions. One is, um, is, is there a primary mechanism or a sort of classic mechanism by which fossils are formed typically in um, volcanic environments? You mentioned lots of places that are associated with volcanism where there are fossils. Um, is the fossilization yeah, process? There are many, 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 many places that have fossils that have no, no ash. And so I was just digging through the literature to find places where explosive eruptions not only caused flooding, but then provided the silica to preserve the, the petrified wood and, and silicify the, the fossils. But, um, you know, there's, there's many, many fossil sites that don't have any volcanic ash. Um, but I think that the thing that I was real excited when I went there was 
why are there so many fossils preserved here? Because, you know, in, in general, these Paleo Valley deposits don't have fossils. I mean, usually non-marine, you know, Paleo Valleys, valleys there's not a lot of fossils preserved <laughs> unless unless you're like on a big floodplain and there may be that some dinosaurs get preserved on a big floodplain or something but generally they're not a great place to find fossils so i was like why are there so many fossils here and then when i saw the pumice and ash i was like oh that's why <laughs> so it's a good way to preserve but most you know many many fossils are preserved in the marine environment because they fall down on the seafloor and then they get buried and then it gets compacted and hopefully they don't get too squished mm -hmm. <laughs> during the compaction. But, um, you know, and, and I mean, Rush Shapiro works on all kinds of fossil localities that have nothing to do with volcanic ash. But, but this one was like, yay, <laughs> it's volcanism. Um, yeah, so. Great. So really it's a, a trick of preservation. Um, there yeah. might be lots of organisms that that don't get preserved and don't get preserved and, and right. certainly in this level of yes. collection kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so in, in referring to the fossil um, organisms, um, you've been using the term Miocene Zoo. Um, is that a formal name? Is that something that is often used I to refer to? I picked it up from some of the press releases. I can't mm -hmm. even tell you which ones. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, I was on Facebook looking at these press releases and then I started looking at more of them and then I was like, hey, Ross, what, what, what's the deal? I sent him an email, you know. Um, so I think I just got that, the Miocene Zoo from press releases. Gotcha. I don't know if... if it might people, be a more informal kind of more way informal. to refer to it. I just okay. thought it was a good name because it really is a huge variety. And, and as my abstract said, mm -hmm. I'm, this is not my specialty, but... That it was a it was a time of climate change, and there were, um, you know, grasslands and forests kind of coexisting in the same area. So that I'm sure that helped with the diversity. I'm focusing on the the volcanism. Gotcha. <laughs> Great. Um, so one person is asking where exactly this site is, and I just want to remind folks that that's not something that is um, being shared precisely. And that's to protect the site. Um, mm -hmm. We wouldn't want folks to come in and uh, sort of love it to death, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's an active scientific site. Um, okay. um, last week we heard um, that it's in the East Bay Municipal, municipal, municipal Utilities District. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's generally where it is. But that's and about it's not specific. far from Sacramento. I think we can yeah. say <laughs> that without being too. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Great. Yeah. And then another question is asking when folks can come visit the museum to see the collection. And um, that is going to be uh, opening on October 22nd um, and will be at the museum through 2022. Um, and in, in all of its exhibition, um, you know, the full exhibition, I should say, and probably pieces will be at the museum uh, more informally beyond that. Um, so another question, Kathy, is uh, wondering if you could describe briefly how you choose samples to um, do the dating, how you're comparing that to um, the volcano where they may have come from, those kinds of things. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, yes. Um, okay, so the, the, the one method, the potassium decaying to argon, you use minerals that have potassium to begin with so that the potassium, potassium decays to argon um, and you can measure how much of the daughter product argon there is. And so you, the, the mineral, well, the best mineral is sanidine, which is a potassium feldspar, but it's not very common in, in, uh, the, in the ancestral cascades arc. It does occur, but it's more typical of of high silica volcanoes like giant continental calderas. It's not so typical of, of the andesite strata volcanoes. Um, but you can, there's enough potassium in plagioclase and certainly in hornblende to, to do the to do the um, the dating with the argon. Um, so what I do the first thing is like, you know, I take some pieces back to the lab and get um, thin sections cut, which is basically 
uh, you know, a, they, a piece of the rock is glued onto glass and polished way down so light goes through it. And then you can look at it under a microscope and determine um, what minerals you have for one thing and also how fresh they are because if if it's been altered by fluids or pressure or temperature then it will lose its argon gas so you want you want the minerals to be fresh and i i thought the minerals in the pumices looked very fresh when i was in the field I was like, look at the shiny horn blends. They don't look all grungy. I was very excited. And then looking in thin section, they're they're beautiful. They're they're very good shape. The horn blend and the pledge place. Well, I'm waiting for our microprobe to get back up before I can do a survey to see if there's any sanadine. I doubt there will be, but gotta try. Um, and then the zircon is is a more difficult because it's a very small crystal and it's not. You know, it's not, you can't like in one thin section, you, you know, you wouldn't even see one grain. You have to grind up the rock and do a separation process to try to extract enough zircon for dating. So that's, that's harder to, um, to prepare the sample. And you, sometimes you grind up a bunch of sample and you don't get any zircons at all. And then you're like, Ooh. but you know, hopefully you'll get enough and and that is a technique where really you only need about 25 or 30 crystals of zircon to get a reasonable age on a, on a volcanic rock. Um, and, and so that's, that's easier. But another thing that, um, that, that uh, Montana was trying to do, and, and I haven't heard the results back yet, but um, you can look at zircons in sandstones and, and hope that the youngest zircons in the sandstones will tell you when the sandstone was deposited. But the zircons might end up being a lot older than the depositional age. So that's not as good <laughs> as zircons from pumice. Um, yeah, so. Great. And then the process for deciding if these um, pumices or, uh, or this ash came from the volcano that you mentioned at Ebbets Pass. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, yeah, I, I don't know that I will be able to correlate an exact deposit. Um, it will help if I've got an age. <laughs> That'll help narrow things down. And then I'm not thinking, OK, can it be anything between 10 million years and 4 million years. Once we get the age narrowed down, then we could try looking at trace elements um, and comparing the trace elements in the pumices at the zoo to the trace element data I already have on the volcanic rocks at the crest. Gotcha. Okay, great. Um, so we have a known paleontology aficionado asking a specific question about the fossil site. Um, do you know, has it been designated as a concentration or a conservation Lagerstadt fossil site? Not sure yet. Okay. It might, be, it might be such a recent find that, that those designations haven't been attributed yeah. yet. Um, but we might be able to get a little bit more information about that next week um, when um, Montana Hodges will be speaking. We'll see, or the following week with the um, speaker, Neil Kelly. Um, so I guess um, one thing that we often have are um, young folks in the audience. And Kathy, I wonder if you could say a little bit about your path to becoming a volcanologist of paleo volcanoes. Um, we heard that you're a first generation college student and we have lots of those at Chico State too. But would you mind telling us a little bit about your path? Yes. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't really figure out that I wanted to be a geologist till I was about 22. Um, I was just sort of dabbling in classes at community college, which was almost free and, and working as a dog groomer, giving haircuts to dogs. Um, and I love dogs and it paid pretty well. <laughs> And then uh, at the community college, I thought, well, before I transfer to University of California, I better get my, my science requirements out of the way because they're scary. 
right? <laughs> so I, I better take my two science classes now. And I took um, an introductory geology and then an oceanography class. And by the end of those classes, I was hooked. Um, I loved the field trips. We, went, we also in the oceanography, the Pierce Junior College shared a boat with Occidental College and we went out and, you know, did trawling and, you know, plankton nets and things like that. And, and I, I got really turned on by plate tectonics, which was just getting figured out. Um, and um, I read all the Scientific American articles about plate tectonics. And, and I decided, okay, I want to be a geologist. Now I got to take a lot of physics and math and chemistry. <laughs> and I, I had to do almost all of that at Berkeley because I didn't figure it out until I transferred. So it was, it was difficult. And, you know, none, no one in my family had been to college. I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I could work 35 hours a week and still take a full load of science at Berkeley. And yeah, they didn't have... I don't, they didn't have the kind of counseling for first gen students that they do now. Um, I floundered, but, but fortunately I landed in a, a very small geology department in Berkeley and the professors were really supportive and very helpful. And um, they, you know, they gave, they recommended me for scholarships so I could cut down on my, my dog grooming job. <laughs> and then I, uh, I got to do a senior thesis that was funded by a president's undergraduate fellowship. And I went mapping in the Marin Headlands. Um, and I worked in the potassium argon lab that Garnus Curtis had, and they let me run the mass spectrometer when I was an undergrad and all that. So it was really great. And I learned so much from the graduate students at Berkeley. They were so amazing and so helpful. Um, so then then when I went to Princeton, it was, you know, work real work really hard, but lots of opportunities. You know, if you were working really hard and being productive, there was a lot of opportunities um, to do really interesting things. Um, I was very lucky to get a professor job straight out of grad school, didn't have to do any postdocs. Um, and then uh, at, right after I got tenure, I started having kids. <laughs> I had one kid and then I had twins. <laughs> wow. And that wasn't fertility drugs, it was just me. <laughs> so I had three kids in diapers for a while there, but uh, three daughters, and they all went to the University of California. So I feel like I, I went to the University of California. I taught at the University of California. My daughters all went there. I, and I'm, I'm really grateful for public education. I really am. That's great. Very cool. Okay, well, Kathy, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us as we're learning more and more about this wonderful um, fossil find. Um, we just can't thank you enough for taking the time to share that with us. And um, if we were, you would hear a roar of the crowd if we were in person, um, but we thank you so much. And um, thank you to the audience, everyone who's been here and had um, great questions. We remind you that um, the lecture series continues on this fossil exhibition. Um, next week, we have um, another talk on October 20th, the same, same time and place, um, Wednesday evenings um, for the next two weeks. So Dr. Montana Hodges will be here next week, and then Dr. Neil Kelly the week after that. So we encourage you to join us again and let folks know um, about this series. We'll have the talks posted very soon. Um, as, as soon as we can get them up, um, they'll be on Gateway's um, website. And you'll see in the chat the link to um, the MWOW series. So thank you all so much. We look forward to seeing you here again next week. And thank you again, Kathy. Thank Have you for inviting me. I, I want to thank you too, Kathy. And I think uh, Rachel has said everything I was going to say, other than you've really taught us a lot and helped us think about what we might see if we look at the landscape. So definitely Folks, tell your friends, and uh, these will be archived. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>